Hello, everybody, and welcome to this month's conversation with Speak Up for the Poor. Before I introduce my guests, I would like to remind the Dining for Women family that there are two major events coming up, and we would love for you to join us. First, we will be announcing our name change on March 6th. Keep an eye out for our newsletter so that you can join us. And also in March, uh, Dining for Women has been accepted for a parallel event at CSW 65, which is the Commission on the Status of Women. And this will be a virtual event. So we will have multiple grantee guests and we will be talking about gender equality, women and climate change. So do join us. That event is on March 17th, Wednesday at 7 p.m. More details to come. But right now, let me take you to Bangladesh and introduce you to Troy Anderson, who is the International Director for Speak Up for the Poor, and he is joining us from Kulna, Bangladesh. Uh, hello, Troy. Come in, Achen. I'm in Balawachi. Don't know about Vina. Uh -huh. I'm doing well. Thank you, Vina. Okay. Uh, we also have Debbie Maddox, who is the CFO and a board member for Speak Up for the Poor. And she is joining us from Los Angeles. Thank you both for being here. I believe, Troy, you have a presentation to share with us. So why don't you go ahead and do that? I do. Thank you. So thanks, everyone, for giving us the chance to present our work and to supporting and for supporting Speak Up here in Bangladesh. So if you came to visit our work in Bangladesh, you would meet lots of young women like these ones pictured here and that you'll see pictured in this slide in this um, slideshow. So we have a big dormitory here in Bangladesh where 90 girls and young women live coming from 30 villages around Bangladesh. If you came here, you would see these young women who have incredible stories that are either heartbreaking because of some of the backgrounds they come from or very inspiring to you because of the great dreams that they have. Because when we first came to Bangladesh 10 years ago, we would go talk to young women and girls and ask them, what is your dream? Tomar shop no ki, what is your dream in life? And when I first asked girls that question in Bangladesh, they couldn't answer it. And I thought it was because they didn't understand my Bangla but then I realized it was because they didn't understand the concept because two thirds of the girls and young women in Bangladesh are married before the age of 18. And most girls up to this time would be expected simply to be moms, to have babies, and they exist only to please their husband. In place of that, we're creating a whole generation of girls and young women who have dreams for their life, including this young friend, the first girl I've ever met who said she wanted to be prime minister one day. Because girls have so few options in some of the poor villages in Bangladesh and many other places around the world, our mission at Speak Up is to create a new reality for girls in poverty. And if you came here and visited us, you would see that in action. You would see girls like this friend here who says she wants to be a lawyer, to be someone who one day can be an advocate herself for girls like her, because there are many problems for girls around the world, girls in poverty. 30 to 35,000 child marriages every day, one every few seconds. At least 2 million girls and young women caught in commercial sexual exploitation. And perhaps 300 million women, maybe even more during the era of COVID, who suffer domestic violence. All because of the misguided notion that girls and women are less than men, that they exist only to have babies, to cook and to clean, to be second class citizens. But we're trying to do something very different with thousands of young girls here in Bangladesh who want to be future teachers and lawyers and doctors and nurses. So what you need to do to stop this great exploitation of girls is to create a new reality, create a new solution. So if we see girls themselves as a solution, they can be the ones who will be the future professionals that a country like Bangladesh needs. So what to do is stop exploiting girls see them as the solution and then repeat that perhaps 300 400 million times and you'll transform the world. Then you'll see great hordes of girls like these young women in our program who are saying here why they want to stay in school, to educate children, to stop the dowry system, to be nurses and lawyers and doctors, to be treated better by a husband, even to be a future police officer. We have now 1,500 girls in 30 villages, hundreds more in our waiting list that want to build better futures 
who don't want to be child brides. And with your support, which I'll explain what we're gonna do with that in a minute, we're gonna help hundreds and hundreds of these young girls stay in school and on path for their dreams. The way we empower girls specifically is to keep girls in school through grade 12. For older girls, we provide dormitories and stipends so that they can pursue a higher education, especially for nursing school, which we have many girls in nursing school now. And then we help those young women get jobs. Many of the young women who have finished our program now are nurses, a few are physician's assistants, and a few are in their master's program so that they can be teachers and professors one day. The opportunity is really unlimited. When there are 40,000 or perhaps more girls around the world who drop out of school every day, instead we can flip that and have those 40,000 be potential doctors and teachers. For every additional year in school that a girl stays in school, she will increase her family's income by at least 10%. And we consider this the world's greatest untapped resource. So today, as I explained, we have so many girls in 30 villages We've reduced the child marriage rate in those villages where we work. We have many nursing grads, and we just added 150 new young women to our program in January in sixth grade, who one day will be joining us in our dormitory as graduate students in five or six years. Here are some of the nurses there in our program who just finished nursing school in January a year ago. All six of them, the first educated young women in their family, certainly the first nurses ever to come out of their villages. And in fact, they will be a part of implementing the Dining for Women funding in the coming year. With the funding that we receive from Dining for Women, we're going to do self, um, health and safety training for girls in 30 villages. This training will include everything to, for, um, from body image to being in safer relationships, how to be, um, stop abuse, um, how to have clean sanitation in your villages. When you're in a very poor, crowded village, there are lots of health and safety issues. And we're going to be teaching many girls throughout the year about these issues. And the girls who themselves have graduated through our program are going to be doing some of that training. So we'd love to have you join us. We'd love to have you research and look into learning about our organization. And some of these beautiful young women that you see in this, on this um, slideshow, they are currently in our program, some of them living in our dorm, some of them still in the villages, but they are the ones who are going to be receiving the health and safety training through your funding, and we are very grateful for your support. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Troy, and when, why, there you are. Um, so thank you for that wonderful presentation. Uh, since you're on the uh, in the field, on the ground, uh, within these communities, you spend most of your time with them. Can you give us, give the Dining for Women family an understanding of the cultural context? Yes, Bangladesh is a highly densely populated country. It's a Muslim majority country, but Bangladesh is putting some efforts into the work for women and girls. But tell us who the families are, you know, who are these girls? What are they up against? Yeah, so we're working in some of the very poor rural villages in Western Bangladesh and in a few of the slum areas near Kulna City. And our program is about 50, 50, 50% 50 Hindu, 50% Muslim. So even though Bangladesh is 90% Muslim, we live in a little bit more of a Hindu area. And these um, families that we're working with, both Hindu and Muslim are mostly day laborers. The moms mostly are not working, they're stay at home moms. The dads are day laborers. Most of the Hindus are descendants of the untouchable caste system. So they tend to be the very poorest and the uneducated and even are landless. So they're working on other people's lands. So because of this um, high crowding, because of some religious considerations, but more because of the um, history and culture and ideas about women's roles, there tends to be a very traditional family structure and most girls tend to be dropped out of school and married when they're in their early teens. So that's some of the cultural context, but like anywhere in the world, kids are dreamers and they want to do something better. And so once you light that fire, the little girls are unstoppable and they want to do something much better with their life. 
Mm-hmm. Yes, and Dining for Women has seen this in every country that we have funded, every project we have funded, light the fire under the girls, and boy, can they take off. It is yeah. so reassuring to see that. Um, Debbie, um, as I was re- referencing that um, Bangladesh has made some strides in uh, gender equality, they have passed laws, and they have made progress. But present the picture to us. Yes, there is rural urban divide, but what else can you tell us? Well, yes, Bangladesh has definitely made progress. But like many places around the world, a lot of the progress is more concentrated in the more urban and affluent areas where our girls have the opportunity to have education from a very early age and quality education all the way through. It's very different for the girls that we work with. Like Troy said, we're in rural Bangladesh in some of the poorest of the poor villages and they just haven't seen that type of opportunity yet. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to give them the resources so that they have the opportunity to pursue their dreams and to um, change how their community see their potential for the future. Absolutely. So in Speak Up for the Poor's work in child marriage, where you're trying to delay child marriage and the consequences for the young girls who get pushed into it, uh, can we reflect a little bit on what's really happening on the ground? Because parents actually are seeking economic security for their girls, even though they believe it is only through child marriage. So what can you tell us, Troy? Yeah, so... When people ever ask me why child marriage, I say it's not because people are trying to be abusive or they're being bad parents. In fact, for most dads, it's what they understand means to be a good father, is to find the best husband they can for their daughter and to put her in a situation where she'll be safe with a young man that's going to take care of her. So if that's all the father himself has seen, that's what he knows is the way to take care of his daughter. I mean, there is a difficult side to it. If you think that your daughter is a burden from birth, then you might not necessarily be looking out for her best economic interest and you're trying to get rid of her as soon as possible. But really it all comes down to economics at some level because it's really here in Bangladesh, Christians, Muslims, and Hindu, the three religious groups that there are here, there are child marriages in all of those groups. So it's beyond religion. It's essentially a cultural phenomenon that I believe comes mostly from economics. When there isn't a lot of opportunities for girls, then they're a burden. And then there are some even some safety issues where you feel like at least if she's married, she's not going to be bothered by other men. And so these things come together for a dad mostly to make a calculation that it's better for his daughter to be married at age 15. So we're trying to change that calculation by explaining some of the negative effects of child marriage and then the positive things that will come if she gets an education. Absolutely. And you said there are some really proud fathers who have daughters who are almost earning double their salaries, right? Yeah. So some of the nurses might make very low salary to start, but it equals their dad's salary who's working six tough days in the field. But pretty quickly, within a year or two, she'll make double his salary and one day probably five, ten times as much if she builds her nursing career. Certainly teachers, anyone who gets into the government service will make significantly more in the future. So when dads see that and know even their daughter might marry a guy who would get an equal salary, they think this would be a great situation where my son-in-law and my daughter both make ten times my salary one day. Sign me up for that. Wonderful. So you are creating cultural transformation in a really, really short time. That is absolutely wonderful. But tell us, uh, what are some adjustments you're making in the time of COVID? So um, in the middle of last year, when COVID really, well, the schools have been shut down for about nine months in Bangladesh. They still are. We hope they open in February. But um, we diverted some of our funding to do like emergency relief for families who are really suffering financially and to do some um, health and safety training and to provide like basic sanitation supplies and masks, things like that. Um, Now um, COVID is affecting us and that we can't meet in large groups. So even some of the health and safety training we're doing with the Dining for Women money isn't gonna be in big groups, it's gonna be in smaller groups. So COVID is forcing some adjustments to, to our program, mostly where we can meet and how big of meetings we can have. 
Okay. Well, this is all really wonderful news. We wish you both the absolute best for this wonderful program that you have. Uh, we do know you're talking about culturally sensitive issues, sexual reproductive health with these young girls, but I am sure one of those girls will become a prime minister one day. They wow. have it in them and we can see it in their faces. Uh, before we wrap up, I just wanted to thank the Dining for Women family for hanging in there with us during the very difficult year of 2020 that we has just ended. Most of you will be watching this video in the month of February, but we are actually recording this on January 11th. And so it is pretty new to us. The new year is very new to us. Uh, when things were very rough last year, it was tough to kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel. But I'm so happy to report that Dining for Women members did step up and you have helped us to end the year 2020 in a very, very stable way so that we can support projects like Speak Up for the Poor. So thank you. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Please look for our um, emails and for our newsletters to tell you how well we actually ended last year. Yes, uh, donations did go down, but a lot of you did step up. Those of you who wrote to your congressmen and congresswomen and you became part of Dining for Women's advocacy for women and girls, thank you. We hope you will join us again and make 2021 a banner year for women and girls everywhere. Thank you so much.